Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all for attending my talk today. I'm Hema Virabi, and I'm working as a software engineer here in the AI Ops team and the AI Center of Excellence at Red Hat. In today's talk, I mainly want to go over um, what exactly is DevOps from a data science perspective, uh, what are some of the GitOps principles that could actually be applied um, for a machine learning model development lifecycle, uh, a quick demo on an overview of a machine learning use case and how we can integrate GitOps into it, um, and finally, leaving some time for any uh, Q&A that you may have. Uh, with that, I also want to mention um, I have a couple of poll questions that I've created, uh, and I think um, Hemant and um, Eric would probably be dropping it in. So uh, please do uh, take some time to answer those poll questions. Um, I, I would definitely love to hear um, what kind of audience um, is sort of interested in this kind of topic. And yeah, uh, also drop any other questions that you may have and I'll try to um, get them uh, answered by the end of the presentation. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So what exactly is DevOps? DevOps is part of the um, Agile Manifesto, and one of the principles which I believe is highly relevant is stated as so. Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Now, in the case of uh, machine learning examples, it would basically be continuous delivery of valuable insights from data. So how exactly is this different from your traditional uh, DevOps approach? So when you look at um, your traditional software development lifecycle, we know that it comprises of a series of steps. So for example, you start off with creating your source code for your uh, software or application. You go ahead and start building out this uh, software or application. You go ahead and create your integration testing uh, to make sure your uh, application is meeting all the requirements. Finally, once you're happy with these tests, you go ahead and deploy it into a production environment. And lastly, you have uh, monitoring in place to observe the performance of this software in your production environment. And typically, all of this uh, takes place in a couple of minutes. So meaning that this entire end-to-end um, -end sort of life cycle is pretty rapid and it's pretty fast. Now, this is not entirely the case when you consider um, a machine learning uh, development life cycle, for example. So machine learning model deployments are quite different in nature as compared to your uh, software deployments. A recent survey conducted by Algorithma actually found that 55% of companies have not even been able to deploy their machine learning models. And those which managed to have these machine learning models deployed, it was seen that uh, very few of them, around 15%, managed to have it within a week. Uh, some of them, or vastly a majority of them, around 50% of them, managed to have it within a time frame of one week to three months. And then you had a small portion um, who were able to do it within uh, more than three months, and some even taking a couple of years. So clearly we can see that there is some sort of discrepancy between the fast release of software um, applications versus your machine learning deployments. So why is this so? Now, when you look at a uh, machine learning model uh, deployment process, the core component is basically training your machine learning model. So when you're training this machine learning model, one of the challenges we see is that the code that you have for your uh, model training purposes is independent from the data itself. And also the machine learning model is the resulting artifact that comes out of this model training process. So in your code of your machine learning model, it's basically where you define um, all the algorithms that you're looking into for training your <laughs> machine learning model. So this could be um, deep neural networks, for instance. It could be clustering algorithms. Uh, it could be regression-based models that you're looking into. And this is where you're actually defining the architecture of your model, along with configuring various uh, parameters required to train these machine learning models. The data is, of course, a very important uh, aspect for your machine learning model. You need to validate your data, you need to uh, clean it up, and also 
ensure that you're able to shuffle it um, accordingly and extract all the relevant features that are needed for your machine learning model training. And finally, you'll have uh, the machine learning model uh, created ultimately out of this. And we basically look at all its outputs. We look at uh, the predictions of these models. Uh, we try to understand the performance, the accuracy, um, and we look at the key metrics for looking at the obse observing the performance of this model. And once you're happy with it, we go ahead and uh, try to get it deployed into production. So as you can see, the uh, machine learning code is only a small part of this entire solution. There are uh, multiple components involved and um, acting sort of dependently throughout this process. So often we also see various teams who are involved um, in this entire machine learning uh, model development process, right? So for instance, you have your uh, data engineers who are looking at um, consolidating data from various sources, making it easily available and accessible for your data scientists. Uh, you have your data scientists who are uh, mainly concerned with uh, extracting this data, building the machine learning model for it. And in our team, we use a tool called Jupyter Hub or Jupyter Notebooks for actually uh, writing up the code for this machine learning model. And once we have this uh, machine learning model available by the data scientists, they typically work with um, DevOps engineers or they work with other developers on the team to have this machine learning model running into your uh, production or OpenShift uh, platforms, for example. Now, uh, having worked with data scientists myself and um, in fact being involved in machine learning projects myself, I've often seen that data scientists are now sort of also being responsible for managing the deployments of their models as well. So it's equally important that the data scientists are also very familiar with um, the DevOps principles, with the GitOps principles, so that it makes it easier for them to understand this end-to-end -end process. So with that uh, comes the importance of GitOps, right? So like I said, in our team, we have multiple data scientists who are uh, collaborating, who are working together to get the code um, for your machine learning model. And hence we need a central location to sort of um, consolidate all of these models and data for which we use GitHub or GitLab. And um, this, this basically allows you to track and uh, modify any other changes that you might need. Similar to how your software applications need to be version controlled in Git, we also would want the machine learning models to also be version controlled and tracked inside Git. And this also allows us to um, uh, have external contributors so they can submit their PRs, uh, somebody who wants to sort of um, improve the performance of the model. Uh, they can just create a pull request to the repository with their changes. And uh, we have our continuous integration pipelines in place. So this can be like a Jenkins pipeline, which is basically uh, checking uh, whether your code successfully goes through. And um, if so, it basically containerizes your entire application, creates a container image out of it, um, and you can then push this into your query repository. And then comes the aspect of continuous deployment. So you have your application manifests, again, which are uh, residing within Git, and our team uses Argo CD as the uh, deployment tool to uh, have these applications uh, deployed and having them running um, within OpenShift platform. So essentially, you see that GitOps is also highly um, relevant for a data science perspective. So now that we know this entire GitOps principles and how it's sort of applicable, let's look at the entire workflow of how uh, this looks like from an end-to-end -end, uh, machine learning model deployment process. So as you can see, first of all, we have the uh, data enthusiasts who are basically looking at the data, um, trying to figure out some insights from it, uh, performing all of their analysis and creating the machine learning model. And like I said, we use uh, something called as Jupyter Hub um, as the primary tool here. Um, you'll also see this in the demo, which I have um, in the next couple of minutes. So once they have this sort of um, created 
and developed, they basically push all of their code into Git. And once you have that into Git is where we want to now have these containerized uh, images pushed into Quay, for which we have uh, what we call as Tekton pipelines. So this Tekton pipelines is nothing but um, an uh, open source end-to-end um, -end framework, basically, which allows you to create your CI CD systems, allowing developers to build, uh, test, and deploy these um, applications across uh, uh, across various cloud uh, platforms. And we work with our um, uh, thought team, which basically is the AI uh, DevSecOps teams within our organization. And they primarily work a lot with setting up this kind of uh, continuous integration and uh, continuous deployment pipelines. So we were able to get their help to have this configured uh, for our use case. So essentially what this Tekton pipeline does is uh, for all the changes that we submit and we push it into um, your GitHub repository, uh, you can associate your changes with the new tag, just like how you have new releases and new tags uh, for software development. We do this, follow the same process uh, we make all our changes associated with the tag. And when you create this new tag inside your GitHub repository, um, it triggers this Tekton pipeline, right? So what the pipeline does is it triggers that there's a new tag being created for your repository. Um, it creates the container for your entire uh, machine learning application code, and it pushes this container image into Quay. So Quay is nothing but your container image a registry which allows you to store, build, distribute, and deploy your containers. So uh, that's the pipeline in basically in the configuration we specify, um, which is the query repository you want this image to go into. And uh, there are certain other configurations that we would need to um, set up inside the repository. And once that's done, um, it sort of uh, pushes it on its own. It takes a couple of minutes to run through all the checks and then makes that image available now inside Quay. And this image can now be used inside your production, which is the third and final step. So you can use this to sort of um, expose your machine learning model. Let's say you want to expose it as a web service. Um, you want to sort of uh, publish all your predictions of your machine learning model um, into some kind of web application. So you basically can do all of that and have that final um, deployment sort of customized for your use case. And like I said, in our team, we use Argo CD for sort of um, managing these deployment manifests. And um, ultimately, let's say your goal is to have some kind of dashboard or some kind of insights that you want to share uh, about what this model is doing with your stakeholders. And you could also um, have that exposed as well as part of your entire uh, pipeline. So this is basically the overall workflow and in the demo, I mainly want to focus um, particularly on step one and step two, uh, basically seeing for what is it like for a data scientist to interact with this sort of CI pipeline. So now that we know this entire workflow, you can sort of get an idea that most of the customer sort of questions or requirements from an end-to-end -end machine learning perspective is sort of being addressed over here starting with how do we have our code and how we have our simulation and deployments to production. And our solution to this is we're looking at a container-based CI-CD approach. How do we want to look at um, maintaining and managing all these declarative configurations? Our approach to that is solved with our end-to-end -end GitOps uh, sort of framework that we have set up. And of course, how do we do all of our data processing? We're using all the open source AI ML stacks, which are available. Um, like I mentioned, Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Hub or Jupyter Notebooks is uh, one of the primary open source tools we use to do all of our data wrangling and data processing. And finally, where do we do all your machine learning model training and deployment and pushing it finally into production? And for this is where we actually use the Open Data Hub platform, which has um, CI CD enabled with it. And um, if, if you had the chance to sort of attend uh, the keynote today, um, you would have uh, heard about uh, this Open Data Hub and this Operate First sort of initiative. Um, if not, we also had a prior talk, I believe, by Michael and Tom, 
who sort of gave a walkthrough of what exactly is um, the Open Data Hub platform. So before I sort of um, dive into the demo aspect of it, I will be using uh, one component of Open Data Hub. So for those who may not have heard about it, um, Open Data Hub is an end-to-end -end AI machine learning platform um, available here at Red Hat. Um, and it basically integrates a collection of multiple open source projects, which can be used as from a data scientist perspective, which can be used as a data engineer, uh, which can be used from a monitoring perspective. So it basically integrates all these bunch of tools. And um, some of the tools, like I said, are Jupyter Hub, Argo CD. Uh, we have monitoring tools like Prometheus and Grafana. Uh, we have visualization tools like um, Apache Superset and various other uh, open source tools available. So if you're interested to learn more about this, um, I would encourage you to go to opendatahub.io. Um, and we also have a community over there available or looking for any contributions as well. And if you're simply just interested um, to sort of play around with this, I would definitely suggest to um, have a look at that. So with that, I think I'll go ahead um, and move on to the demo. So let me go ahead and quickly switch screens a bit. All right. So this is um, the Jupyter Hub instance we have uh, publicly available um, as part of our Operate First um, initiative. So you don't need to be uh, connected to VPN or anything of that sort. It's publicly available. Um, I'll also try to drop it in chat in case you guys are interested uh, later on to sort of see where this is. So when you go to this URL, um, you see this button to sign in with OpenShift. Um, so you can go ahead and click over here. Uh, we have this, you, you basically this entire Jupyter Hub instance is hosted on the mass open cloud um, cluster. So that's where it's currently hosted at. So this is the login for that. Um, you can go ahead and click on Google account and I'll go ahead and log in with my Red Hat email ID. And once that's done, uh, Jupyter Hub actually throws this spawner UI option for you. So it has a bunch of notebook images that you can actually spawn from. So for each of our projects, we have actually created a customized notebook image for every project and we've um, made them available here. And apart from that, we also have some default notebook images that you can play around with um, if you're interested in playing around with TensorFlow if you're interested to play around with Spark, uh, these are some notebook images that are supported. Um, for this demo, I'll go ahead and just uh, spawn a simple default uh, minimal notebook. And once that's done, you go ahead and click on start. And then uh, it'll take a few minutes to just get the um, PVC attached for your particular server. And uh, once that's done, you should be able to uh, be successfully into the Jupyter Hub UI. So while that's doing, um, taking time to uh, spin up, I want to go through uh, this particular machine learning use case that I'm showing in my demo today. Uh, so this is the repository. Um, I created a fork of this. Uh, this is the uh, upstream repository within our uh, uh, team's organization. I've just taken a fork of it for the purpose of this demo. So what we're essentially doing in this project is we are trying to identify um, if we can apply AI and machine learning for identifying flaky tests or predicting any test failures um, that we see in our continuous integration testing pipelines. So um, the ultimate goal of this is basically to alleviate uh, developers from manual time, um, sort of debugging why exactly did a certain test fail. Um, so we just wanna understand the CI pipeline a little bit more in depth and see if we can come up with some kind of intelligent solution, um, allowing developers more insights into what the CI sort of tests look like. And the data set that we're actually looking at is the test grid data set. So test grid data set is publicly um, made available by uh, Google Cloud uh, Platform. So they've made this uh, test grid uh, data available that we're actually looking at, which basically gives us um, 
combination of tests that have run on different OpenShift platforms or on different Red Hat platforms, um, along with the timestamps of when these tests were run, uh, whether the tests passed, whether the tests failed, or were they flaky in nature. So that's essentially what this uh, project is trying to do. It's still in a very early um, sort of exploratory phase right now, but um, I thought it would be an uh, interesting project to look at um, from a data science perspective. So let's see if um, the Jupyter Hub is up. So yes, the server came up. And uh, once that's up, you see um, a bunch of folders. So basically I've been um, getting all my forks and repositories inside over here. So you can see the OCP CI analysis uh, repo. I've already uh, cloned that over here. And you also have a terminal, uh, which again allows you to um, easily interact with your um, repositories that you want to base off of. So you can see I have already set up my upstream repo and I have my uh, local port repo as well. So let's go ahead and look at some of the notebooks. So as I mentioned, um, we're looking at the test grid data set. So I have this notebook here called test grid clustering dot um, IPYNB. So that's the uh, extension of your notebooks when you create this uh, code within Jupyter Hub. And uh, typically it's uh, solely based on Python. So most of the packages and everything would be um, dependent on Python. So in this notebook, what we're doing is um, basically going over the test grid data set and try to see if we could find some interesting features out of it. And um, like I said, we have a bunch of Python packages that we are sort of using throughout this notebook. So we start, go ahead and start importing them and we've defined these in our uh, pip files as well, which um, reminds me to install all of these dependencies so that the notebook runs without any um, issues and uh, any dependency issues. So while that's um, installing all of these um, packages, um, I'll just go over what the notebook is doing. So as you can see here, we have the test grid data set, right? So we have uh, tests, uh, each individual tests on this column on the left side. Um, and we here, here we have all the timestamps associated for every test and uh, all the different runs executed for each of these tests. Um, if the tests failed, if the tests were successful, if they were uh, having any sort of shaky nature, um, all of these are sort of indicated in this test grid data set. So we are basically trying to look at this, these different grids that we obtain from test grid. We're trying to see if there are any duplicates such grids based on different platforms where we're collecting this data from. Um, just simple answering simple questions um, like are there any subgroups within these tests? Uh, which tests do all the sort of groups share in common? Um, and just sort of looking at this data from a um, analytical point of view. And then having all of these sort of key metrics that we want to track, like what was the test case, um, test coverage percentage, what were the total number of tests, and so on. And how can we also compare these tests if there was any common sort of behavior among them. Um, so that, that's more of the analytical uh, steps that we're doing within these notebook. And uh, we're also trying to sort of plot it in a more visualized appealing manner. And, and the main part is basically, what are the features that we want to look at, right? So for example, I want to look at what is my test pass rate. I want to look at um, how many failures we've been having. What is the sort of trend that you see in your failures? Is there like a failure streak um, commonly observed for your tests. So what is the frequency of these kind of tests? So these are some um, sort of features that we came up with or key metrics that we thought would be relevant for our um, analysis of these tests. And hence we consolidate them into this uh, neat data frame, which has these six um, key features that we wanna um, further build our machine learning model on top of. So now that we have these features ready, and what exactly we want to sort of um, observe, we can now visualize, visualize these data points that you have. 
So um, like I said, here we have like six dimensions, but of course, if you're looking at a 2D plot, you need to um, sort of cut down your dimensions so that it's suitable. So from a six uh, dimensions, we go into two dimensions. So we have this Python um, function or this basically a technique called the PCA technique. Um, don't want to go into too much technical details, but it's basically um, a method where you can cut down these dimensions. So you basically say that I want to cut it down to two dimensions, and then you go ahead and um, plot your data points accordingly. So the purpose of this plot was to actually sort of see if, um, as you can see, these kind of points are scattered, right? So you can see that some seem to be sort of clustered in one group, some seem to be outliers, and so on. So this sort of was the motivation for us to go ahead and train a clustering model, right? So it gives us labels on what are the different type of clusters based on the features we've defined and how each of these individual data points um, get grouped into these clusters. So for that, we have this uh, clustering model called dbscan. Um, so we've basically invoked um, to train this dbscan clustering model and then finally give us the output of this clustering model. So it's basically just an array. So for every uh, data point, it's uh, telling us which cluster does it belong to and so on. And finally, we want to save all of this cluster model. So we, you can store it in like a pickle file, you can store it in a job lib file, uh, depending upon your use case. And once we do that, I'll go ahead and run all of these cells above. So yeah, once you do that, um, you can basically um, load this uh, stored pickle file or job lib file, whatever it is, and we can check to see if it's the same. Yes, we see that it's uh, resulted in the same as what we've seen over here. Uh, so now let me go ahead and just change this name just for the purpose of the demo. So I'm just going to load it again. Um, ah, sorry. Need to do it here as well. So go ahead, um, store it with a different name, and um, again, load this as a different name. So now you should be able to see this new pickle uh, model file available. So now I want to actually push these changes, right? So you can see that there's this new uh, model file available. Um, I do not want to modify my notebook, so I'm going to ignore that particular change that happened. And I just want to add this new pickled uh, file. I'm going to say this is my updated trained model. And now you should see my new latest commit over here on top. And now I'm just going to push this to my branch. It has some permission issues, I think. Let me resolve those. Okay. Try that again. All right. So this basically is pushing all my changes into my repository. Um, and if we go here, just do a quick refresh, um, you should see this new commit being pushed. We should see our new um, train model over here, um, this test pickle updated train model, right? So awesome. Now, how do you want to trigger your Tekton pipeline, right? So like I said, there are these tags associated that can be configured in your repository. Um, if we go to the repository here, you would see a bunch of tags. So let's create a new tag. And the version 0 0.0.5.3. Um, and now I'm going to push this with this new tag. So when you go to your repository, do a quick refresh. 
um, I see this new tag has been created in my repository. Now, the most important thing for setting up the CI pipeline is we have this um, YAML file where you're actually setting up this entire CI pipeline, which the Thoth team were happy enough to tell us how to do it. Um, so they have also documentation as well on how you can set this up. So the main important things that you need to provide here is basically details on where you want to push this image, right, of your container image of your um, application. So we are using Quay in our case. I'm using my own personal account in Quay. I have a project created within Quay where in which I want to sort of push all my images to. So this is what the Quay um, image registry would look like. I have this CI analysis project created for my project. And these are the various tags associated with it, right? So for every tag release that happens, it basically gets pushed and the image, once the pipeline runs successfully, it gets pushed into this repository over here. And we also have a Tekton dashboard. So like I said, all of these are being triggered um, with the Tekton pipeline, since you saw that I pushed it as a new image, uh, as a new uh, tag, it got uh, triggered and this is the latest uh, pipeline run that's been running. It's a tag release run. And if we go into uh, more details, you get to see what are all the tasks associated, um, what's the status of these um, tasks and the steps within these tasks. And it's not necessarily that all the tasks would pass. Some of them would also get skipped. So like you can see here, uh, four of them were skipped and they were not relevant for our particular um, tag release. And finally, this is the last uh, step that's currently running. And once it's successful, so basically this is the final part where it's actually pushing it into Quay. So once this is um, completely green and once all of these steps have completed, we should eventually see this new image uh, tag being created in our repository here. So those are pretty much the steps that we need to do to configure the CI um, pipeline. And this is the repository the uh, Thought team uses, and they have a great documentation on how this entire architecture is set up for them and how you can uh, use it for your purposes. And that's about it, I think, um, in terms of my demo. Um, while this is sort of taking a few more seconds, I think a few more minutes to just run, uh, I just want to go back um, and conclude by sort of saying that um, there are many other tools out there which sort of give the same kind of results. It doesn't have to be Tekton. It doesn't have to be. Um, it, it doesn't have to be any of these sort of tools that we have used in our team. But uh, there are also some great tools that we also want to explore uh, more in the future, such as Kubeflow pipelines or Elira, which are which is basically nothing but a Jupyter Lab extension. And um, like how you saw in the Jupyter Hub, uh, the Elira basically allows you to create like a drag and drop pipeline for your entire uh, machine learning model development. And you can alloc uh, allocate resources for every single step in your machine learning uh, deployment process. So this is something uh, new that we want to definitely try out and sort of integrate, making it easier for data scientists also um, to get hands on into setting up these uh, sort of pipelines and workflows uh, for their use cases. So with that, um, thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to um, have them answered now. I think uh, I'll have a quick look so that I can stop sharing. Okay, one question I see is how many ML containers are typically generated by the pipeline? One with, uh, oh, I think I lost that question. Uh, ah, there we go. One with all the ML or is it broken out into different model containers? 
Um, so in in this certain use case, it's just it's just one machine learning uh, container that's being sort of created by the pipeline. Um, but you could also definitely break it down as you know you have a project which has multiple um, sort of models that you're trying to train accordingly. So I would definitely say it's left to sort of your use case and your customization that you can do. In this example, it's it's um, definitely just a one simple uh, container that that we are looking at. How about, we also have another question from uh, William Henry. Yeah. How many ML containers are typically generated by the pipeline? One with all the ML or is it broken out into different model containers? Oh, uh, yes, yes. I just, I think I just answered that question. Um, I think the other question was, how do you handle data versioning and, and hyperparameters? Yes, yeah, sorry. In, in your architecture, are you using Kubeflow as part of it in some other way? So yes, so um, hyperparameter tuning is definitely something um, we have right now not really invested in a certain tool per se. Um, in the past, we've used this uh, open source tool called uh, MLflow. So MLflow was pretty useful for us um, where you can sort of, it, it gives you like a UI kind of interface where you can actually plug and drop your hyperparameters and tune your model. Um, but like I mentioned, uh, we now have these Kubeflow pipelines and we now have uh, the project Elira, which I think would definitely be um, a good tool to sort of invest for this kind of hyperparameter tuning use case. Um, but yeah, as of now, we are not really looking too much into that.